Good morning, everyone. We are just about to start. We're just waiting for colleagues to assemble on the call. I'm Professor Kevin Fenton. I'm the president of the Faculty of Public Health. I would like to welcome you to this inaugural lecture, which is part of our distinguished lectureship series in the Faculty of Public Health. This is a new initiative which we're launching in the faculty, and it is part of our Future of Public Health work stream of the Faculty of Public Health. The work stream is a time for us to, in a post-pandemic world, reflect on the changing nature of our public health practice, to hear from inspiring speakers both across the United Kingdom and around the world about how our public health practice is changing, but also new areas where, as public health practitioners, we need to be aware, engaged, and be at the forefront of integrating it into our everyday practices. As part of the lectureship series, we're hoping to hear from experts which will be speaking about developments in public health, but also outside of public health, as we think about the intersections of our practice with other disciplines. The lectureship series is being designed to create an opportunity for us to connect ideas, uh, for thought leadership, and for us to be inspired as we emerge from the pandemic and to think about what else should we be doing and how might we be thinking differently about improving public health and tackling inequalities. I'm so pleased today to have, as part of our Distinguished Lectureship Series, a wonderful speaker to kickstart uh, this new initiative in the Faculty of Public Health. I'm delighted that Professor Kamara Jones, who is the Leverhulme Visiting Professor in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College, is joining us here today. Now, I've known Kamara for nearly two decades. We worked together in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the CDC in the 2000s, and she has been a fantastic colleague and leader in thinking about structural discrimination, race, racism, and health. And no more, no, no further is this even more important. Given our experience of going through the pandemic, where uh, the disparities and inequalities which pre-existed the pandemic were both exacerbated and new inequalities uh, were uncovered. But as a result of our experience, I think we're in a moment in time where a focus on uh, racial and ethnic disparities and other forms of disparities and discrimination have, are at the forefront and healthcare systems, uh, 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 partnerships across the country are beginning to think through and to think differently about ways in which we should be thinking about these structural issues and addressing them. Uh, Professor Jones's work focuses on her uh, uh, research on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on health and well-being around the world. And uh, Professor Jones is known for her extensive use uh, and wonderful use of allegories on race and racism to illustrate topics that often are difficult for people to either understand or to engage with. As I mentioned, uh, she has worked at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, but uh, Professor Jones is also past president of the American Public Health Association and a commissioner on the recently launched O'Neill Lancet Commission on Racism, Structural Discrimination and Global Health, which I'm also serving on as well. Uh, Kamara, welcome uh, and thank you for joining us uh, for this inaugural lecture. We're so excited that you're here with us today and we're looking forward to hearing from you. So without any further ado, over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you for this invitation and congratulations on your work as president so far um, of the Faculty of Public Health and of launching this lecture series. I'm delighted to be able to come and share with you um, some of my work on confronting racism denial naming racism and moving to action. And so if I had you know, my own independent title, I would have expanded on this notion of a public health approach to tackling racism and structural discrimination from rhetoric to impact. That's really what it is. It's from naming racism to moving to action. 
I was president of the American Public Health Association seven years ago now in 2016. And in that role, I launched our association, our 25,000 members, along with the additional 25,000 members in our state public health associations, the affiliated associations and other organizations, as many people as would join us in a national campaign against racism with three tasks. The first task, is and was to name racism, to say the whole word, because we must name a problem in order to get started on the solution. But as necessary as it is to name racism, it's necessary, but it's insufficient. We could be naming racism all day long, but until we move to action, nothing will change. So the second of these three tasks is the first part of action which is to strategize, to ask, really to ask, how is racism operating here? Where the here could be in my child's school, in my workplace, within the faculty of public health, in London, with regard to COVID-19, with regard to maternal mortality rates. Oh, the, how is racism operating here? And what you're doing is once you recognize that racism exists, you understand that it is not a miasma or a cloud, that you can't get a handle on. It is a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms. And what you're trying to do is from your standpoint and with the tools available to you, you're trying to do some landscaping, identify early targets for action, some levers, promising levers for intervention. But once you do that landscaping, then what are you gonna do? Of course, we as individuals do have power. We have the power to put things on agendas, to start lecture series, to speak up and take action on behalf of others, to hire people, to mentor students. We have individual power, but the biggest power and the third task in this national campaign against racism, the biggest power is in collective action. So we must organize and strategize to act. Now, I will say that launching this national campaign against racism on behalf of CDC, I mean, not CDC, whoops, no, not CDC, American Public Health Association, CDC joined much later. Um, but on behalf of APHA, um, it wasn't a, a walk in the park because this was 2016. So, you know, of course, people have been recognizing racism exists, some people for many centuries, other people are in staunch racism denial. In fact, I think that naming racism is perhaps the hardest part because racism denial is so staunchly held by so many in my country and I would say in this country as well. But in 2016, there were no local jurisdictions that had made any kind of declarations about racism at all. But my campaign, I take some pride in, catalyzed the first of what are now 262 local jurisdictions, city councils, county commissions, eight state legislatures, governor statements and the like, across 41 of our 50 US states and the District of Columbia that have made formal declarations that racism is a public health crisis. It actually started with uh, something from a public health association in Wisconsin in 2018. And then, so this is before COVID, before the gruesome murder of Mr. George Floyd. In 2019, Milwaukee County in the state of Wisconsin adopted that public health association statement and it became the first governmental policy that racism is a public health crisis. And then over time, but accelerated, especially after the murder of Mr. George Floyd, 41 of our 50 states. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, actually the director, Rochelle Walensky made a declaration on behalf of CDC in April of 2021 that racism is a severe public health threat. So I just give you this to say that public health in the United States um, has named racism. Some of these, some of these statements stop there. You know, these, these local jurisdictions put a stake in the sand. We recognize racism exists. 
hold us accountable for recognizing that. Other th others of these statements go further and say, and therefore we'll make these kinds of investments, or therefore we're going to invite this input from community and other leaders, or therefore we're gonna have this checklist before we promulgate any more policies. I actually wasn't gonna talk this long on this slide because I'm very well aware of my limited time with you, but I do encourage you to go to www.apha.org Org, the American Public Health Association website. And within that, look for the racism declarations. You can click through to each declaration and see when it was passed, who signed it, what is the wording and the like. So this is something that's important. And it is the first step of now a growingly national campaign against racism. But even with that first step with naming racism, I would like to highlight four key messages that we all need to communicate, understand first and communicate when naming racism. And that is that racism exists. By the time we're naming racism, we recognize it, but we need to communicate that onto others. And that is because racism denial is like a huge black hole in the UK national landscape, just as it is in the US national landscape. A black hole like in the universe, where black holes are massive, they're powerful, they suck everything into them, even light, you can't see them, they're invisible, right? That is how racism denial is operating in our national context right now. So the first key message when naming racism is that racism exists. The second is that racism is a system. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth key message is, yes, we can act to dismantle racism. Now, if I had two hours with you, which is my preferred way of being with people in groups, I would share with you a different teaching story, allegory, for each of these four key messages. But today, I'm only going to share with you one, but the most important starting one, that racism exists. This allegory I call dual reality, a restaurant saga, the moral racism exists. And this, like most of my allegories, is based on something that happened in my own real life. So I invite you right now to step into my shoes when I was a first year medical student. As a first year medical student, I was very diligent, of course, very studious. And so on this particular Saturday, like most, I had awakened early and I was studying hard, hit the books and kept them open. And it was already mid afternoon when some of my friends came over and did they distract me from my studies? No. They were medical students too. So we all got to studying long and hard. And by now it was getting later and later. And we were getting hungrier and hungrier. And I had no food in the apartment at all, which was so typical of me that my friends actually understood. And they almost forgave me. They said, okay, Kamara, we got that. You don't have any food in here, but we're hungry. So let's go into town and find something to eat. So this is where my dual reality restaurant saga starts. We walk into town, we find a restaurant, we walk in, we sit down, the menus are presented, we order our food and the food is served. So if you were in my generation in the United States, you would have thought racism exists, restaurant, I was gonna say we weren't served, but we were. So stay with me in this story. As I sat there with my friends eating, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign that was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now maybe I've intrigued you and you're wondering, okay, Kamara, what did the sign say? You're just dragging this out. Okay, well, what did the sign say? The sign said, open. So now I know I've lost many of you. How is a sign that says open a startling revelation about racism? So let me recap. Here we are sitting in a restaurant eating. I look across the room, I see a sign that says open. Thinking no more about it, I assume other hungry people can walk in, sit down, order their food and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that indeed now the restaurant was closed due to the hour, but firmly closed and that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I recognized that racism structures open closed signs in our society, that racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize there's a two-sided sign going on because it is difficult for any of us 
to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it's difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It's difficult for white Americans and white Brits and white folks all over the world to recognize white privilege and racism. It's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context, even though especially with COVID and then the production, the early production of the COVID-19 vaccines, we were living that American privilege so big by how much of the global supply of COVID vaccine we were sequestering within our nation. Now, those on the outside, they are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims closed to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, why, why you could even talk to the restaurant owner who is after all inside with you. And you could say restaurant owner, there are hundred people outside. Why don't you open the door, let them come in. You'll make more money and all of the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is pass some food through the window. Or maybe you'll try to tear down that sign or break through the door. But at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat. Because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign that proclaims open to you. So when I have five minutes or so to share with a group of people, the understanding that racism exists, or for those who have known it very well, a communication tool to communicate that to others. This is the story I tell. And before I forget to say this, I hope that all of you will remember enough of the elements of this story to actually share it with somebody else today, a colleague, you know, uh, a family member, a, na a neighbor, anybody, but share this story with others today. But I will say also that I have with this single story and a single question, started a three hour long conversation on two different occasions. The question, how could people who were born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign? And on those two occasions, when I just had all the time in the world, we had a three hour long conversation twice because there are many ways to know. I will say this, I am heartened that more people who were born inside the restaurant and maybe just three and a half years ago, might've been sitting there eating and saying, huh, what are those people outside saying? Black lives matter. Don't they know all lives matter? More of those people are now actually proclaiming, yes, black lives matter. More people born inside the restaurant are saying the word racism, putting together the phrases, structural racism, systemic racism. This is heartening, but here is my warning. As necessary as it is for name race, to name racism because we must name a problem to even get started on the solution. As necessary as it is to do that, it is necessary but insufficient. If all we do as institutions is put something on our web pages or as individuals, you know, tweet something out or Instagram or if you're my age, Facebook, whatever you do, as important as it is for us to say that whole word racism, if all we do is name racism six months from today, we are at risk of forgetting why we said that thing. And why do I say that? It's because racism denial is so staunchly held by so many in both of our nations, in the UK and in the US. And it's so seductive that six months from now, if all we say is that racism exists and we just name it there, we may fall into what I describe as the sleepiness, Oh, the somnolence of racism denial, which means we must go beyond naming racism to action. We must tear down the sign. And of course, racism is not just a sign. It's a sign. It's the door. It's the lock. There's a whole system going on. We need to dismantle the lock, take the door off the hinges. And once we start acting, we won't forget why we are acting. 
This is really true. There is a power in action. Now, if we're acting as individuals and we bump up against the thing, you know, against the, we need to anticipate and prepare for pushback. But if we get some pushback, we might be discouraged. But that is part of the power of collective action, actually, because collective action informs us, it inspires us, it propels us and protects us. So once we start acting, especially once we engage in collective action, we will not forget why we are acting. Now, I want to define what I mean when I say the word racism. And when I say that word, I'm clear that I'm talking about a system. I am not talking about an individual character flaw. I'm not talking about a personal moral failing. I'm not talking about a psychiatric illness as some people have suggested. And yes, racism does show up in those ways and many, many more. But in its essence, racism is a system of power. And a system of doing what? A system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured? On what basis is the value assigned? It's based on so-called race, which is the social interpretation of how one looks in a race conscious society. I'll just give you a quick uh, kind of insight to help you get some feeling what I mean by that. So first of all, we know that we have mapped the human genome. There is no basis in our human genome for racial subspeciation. But when I talk about race as the social interpretation of how one looks. In the US, in all parts of the US, you look at me, I'm clearly black. In some parts of Brazil, you look at me and I'm just as clearly white. And I've experienced that. In South Africa, you look at me, I'm just as clearly colored. Here I am, same physical appearance, but the social interpretation of my appearance in those three settings would assign me to three different racial groups. And furthermore, if I were to stay in any of those settings long enough, then my health outcomes, educational outcomes, all of, would take on that of the group to which I've been assigned, even though I'd have the same genes, behaviors, all of that in all three settings. And that is not just, you know, something that's because of me and my kind of light skin, frizzy hair type of appearance. For everybody who is in the sound of my voice, there is some other place on this earth where your so-called race will be quite different from how you are living it today, even if you are living it today as white. So understanding that race is something that's socially assigned, it's the social interpretation of how one looks. Racism is a system that uses that race as a substrate to structure opportunity and assign value day to day right now and across the centuries. And this system has impacts. Now, when people recognize that yes, racism exists, then they finally go, oh yeah, and it's unfairly disadvantaging some individuals and communities. That's an important recognition, but it shouldn't take any of us long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage. So that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. And that's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in the United States and I haven't heard it talked about at all in the UK. Why don't we talk about it? Because it makes some people uncomfortable, especially some people who are living as white. And I used to almost apologize when I would notice people fidgeting in their chair when I got to this part of a talk. You know, and I, I would say, oh, I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable. If you feel uncomfortable, shake it off, stay with me, I'll tell you more stories. But I don't do that almost apology anymore, not at all. Because I recognize if somebody feels uncomfortable acknowledging the reality of unearned white privilege, I encourage those people to lean into that discomfort. And how? By reading more, by reading history, by talking to strangers, by going across town and staying a while. And I encourage them to lean into their discomfort because I have come to recognize that for you, me, for all of us, the edge of our comfort is actually our growing edge. But there's a third impact of racism that most of us miss. And that is that racism is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. When we don't vigorously invest in the full state finance, you know, education of all of our children because the blinders of racism have made some decision makers think that you know, in the US, we, they would say there's no genius in the barrios, no genius in the ghettos, you know, no genius on the reservations. We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids. And I know that there are different areas in, in the UK where there's different amounts of uh, investment and the like, there is genius in all of our communities. And if we were to only vigorously invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as nations and as the world. This 
I could give you so many, I'm trying not to talk deeply into my slides because I'm very aware of my time limits with you. But that last point about how racism saps the strength of the whole society is the impact that I actually would lift up most urgently these days. I think we need more media stories about that, more data collection, more conversations around our faculty tables, around our boardroom tables, around our dining room tables, so that we can have more people filled with a sense of urgency to dismantle this system and put in its place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. I just want to say one more thing, though, about the unfair disadvantage, unfair advantage duality. When I was at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, toward the end of my time, which was toward the end of my time there, I had moved to a part of CDC that was not supportive of my work on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on the health and well-being of the nation. I had been recruited to CDC to bring attention to racism to our nation's lead public health agency, but I moved to another part, and they were like, CDC shouldn't, this was back in 2013, 2014, CDC shouldn't be doing anything with racism at all, but even if they are, certainly not in this division. And I was told I needed to take that point about unfairly advantages off of my slide because it made white people uncomfortable. And then the compromise before I eventually escaped was, well, if you take the words unfairly off of disadvantage and advantage, we can talk about those as long as you don't characterize any as unfair. And that experience taught me not just about that person who is making those demands of me, but actually about many, many people in my country, and I would say probably here in the UK as well, who can acknowledge their two states of being but they would describe them as disadvantaged and normal. And the reason that they would describe the two states of being as disadvantaged and normal is that in my country and yours, we are ahistorical. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. And they do not recognize that their so-called normal is built up on a whole mountain of unfair advantage. Now, the definition I just gave you of racism can be generalized to be a definition of any system of structured inequity. So what is sexism? That is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on gender that unfairly disadvantages some, unfairly advantages others, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And I'm sure you all were thinking as I was defining racism, yeah, 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 but that's not the only thing, Dr. Jones. And clearly it's not. There are many axes of inequity that are operating in our societies today. They're intersecting in communities. They are intersecting in individuals. And all of these are at least risk markers for how opportunity is structured and value is assigned. Even as a smaller group are actually risk factors in the progression to disease or maybe all of them. So then you might wonder, well, Dr. Jones, we understand from what Dr. Fenton just said that you have been spending decades focusing on race as the axis of inequity and racism as the system of structured inequity. Why is that? Is it because you live in the US and you guys are really racist and we don't have to worry about it over here in the UK because we're so 20 years ahead of you guys? No, 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 no. First of all, I focus on race and racism because racism is foundational in my nation's history and wealth. And yet there's so much racism denial. But I would say that you all also need to focus at least all of you need to be actively anti-racism, even as you engage around other struggles. Why? Because also in your nation, racism is foundational in your nation's wealth and history. And there's a lot of racism denial here, more so I would say than even in the, in the US, because when your Seoul, Seoul, Seoul Commission, the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities in 2021, we, presented this report, they documented differences in health outcomes, educational outcomes, police encounter outcomes. But then that, those commissioners said, but there's no structural racism. So anyway, I could spend an hour talking about that. So what I'm saying is when you have an occasion where something is foundational in the nation's history and it continues to live and breathe in the structures, policies, practices, norms, and values in that nation, but people are in denial that it even exists. That is why all of us need to at least be actively anti-racism. And I say anti-racism, not anti-racist, because if you say anti-racist, people will think, oh, is she talking about me? No, we have to all be actively anti-racism. We're talking about a system. The ism is the system. Even as we engage around these other axes of inequity and their associated systems of structured inequity, 
as long as we have, the, as long as racism exists and it's being denied. And to the extent that we're able to dismantle racism, the mechanisms of racism, the other struggles will benefit as well. There are many people in this country and in my country who value comfort. There are many people in this country and in my country who value social justice. And I have come to recognize that valuing comfort and valuing social justice are at polar opposite ends of a value system in our current status quo. I'm not saying that you can't be comfortable while you're working on social justice, but if your whole value system is comfort, unless you expand the comfort for whom to be the comfort for all of us, that is at opposite ends of valuing social justice. And in fact, I've come to understand those who value comfort as being very like those who were born inside the restaurant, sitting at the table of opportunity eating. They value comfort because they are benefited by the status quo. They are comfortable in the status quo. They do not even wonder why nobody else is coming inside the restaurant. They may not even notice it. They're so involved in their food and the conversation in their small company that they keep. They certainly don't want to examine the sign. They may have heard that somebody mentioned there was, that it was a two-sided sign, but in the US, especially, they are passing laws state by state, making it illegal to teach in the schools or to discuss in government settings, uh, racism, social justice, equity, any of those things. They are passing these laws for examining whether or not there's a two-sided sign going on because it will make their children uncomfortable. They don't even care to know what the outsiders are saying. And they certainly don't believe that an outsider could add value to their conversation. Maybe they have been told that they need to diversify their group inside. And so, you know, to make a politically correct picture. And so they bring in, reluctantly bring somebody in, but they don't expect that person to bring genius and creativity and leadership and new perspectives and different lived experiences with them. They certainly don't wonder how the food that they're eating got there. They don't recognize that the same people outside who can't come in and eat are the ones who grew the food, transported the food, cooked the food, served the food, but can't sit there and eat in the restaurant. And these people who value comfort do not want to budge from their seats at the table. They very jealously guard their privilege, which they don't even recognize as privilege, but understand as entitlement. Now, those who value social justice value social justice because they know two things. The things they know are that there's a two-sided sign going on. Many of them know that because they were born outside the sign. They have seen it say close, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. But they also know that the operation of that two-sided sign saps the strength of the whole society. Now, I am not saying that the circumstances of one's birth completely determines your value system. And I recognize that there are people who've been born inside the restaurant who do wonder why aren't other people coming in? What are those people saying? And they do make their way across those barriers outside to experience the common humanity of people in very different circumstances. When they go outside of that restaurant, they see that there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as they are, who are living in very different circumstances. They can read the clothes sign and they understand that and they start valuing social justice. There are those who were born outside who make their way by dent of lots of hard work, maybe some connections, lots of degrees, I'm MD and PH, PhD, and they make their way inside, but often the final price of admission is for them to agree that they will never mention that they saw closed on the other side of that sign. That is often the case. Anyway, anyway, when they get inside, they're often positioned near the window so that um, the other outsiders can see them there. And sometimes they use their position near the window to stick their foot in the door to make it easier for others to get into the restaurant. But sometimes they are the worst gatekeepers and they're actually fortifying the locks. We could have lots of conversations about the movements here and there. But what I will say is this, what we need to do part of our anti-racism work is to move more people from valuing comfort to valuing social justice, even as we recognize that in the current status quo, valuing social justice will not always and maybe not ever be comfortable. But we need to lean into our discomfort because that is our growing edge. I will not have time to share my most iconic allegory with you, which is my Levels of Racism Gardener's Tale, but I will just say that this allegory, uh, which was published 23 years ago now in 2000 and is taught in most schools of public health and schools of medicine, social work and, and undergraduate 
uh, university settings and the like across the US, uh, it's almost like a little cult kind of favorite. It starts with a, a gardener uh, who has two flower boxes, one with rich fertile soil, one with poor rocky soil, she knows this. Seed for the same kind of flowers, she prefers red over pink and get, puts the red seed in the rich fertile soil, pink seed in the poor rocky soil. This is, talks about initial historical injustices, which then manifest as three levels of racism, structural racism, personally mediated racism, and internalized racism. I'm not going to define these. I don't have the time. What I will say is the question that the gardener's tale allegory then asks is, what do we do to set things right in the garden? And spoiler alert, we must at least address the structural racism. Good to level address all the levels at the same time, but at least address the structural racism. And when we do the other levels, would take care of themselves. We also ask who is the gardener? It's the one that I've given the power to decide, the power to act, control of resources, which are the elements of self-determination. And for more on that, I refer you to the four page paper that was published in 2000. It's just two pages front and back. If you want to have a conversation with your teams anywhere about racism, this is a very good introductory thing. Just say, let's read this and discuss this together. I also refer to you uh, refer you to a CDC interview of me that was done in 2002. Um, that is very 2002 production quality, you know, so forgive us now we're 21 years later, but it is where I describe these three levels of racism in detail and then illustrate them with my gardener's tale. And if you want a very short version of the gardener's tale, along with three other of my allegories, then you can uh, see my TED talk from 2014. So now, I said that the three tasks of a national campaign against racism were to name racism and all this stuff I've been giving you so far, the, you know, the, the four key messages when we name racism. Racism exists, racism is a system, racism saps the strength of the whole society, we can act to dismantle racism. The dual reality uh, gardeners, I mean, dual reality restaurant saga that racism exists kind of a quick allusion to my gardener's tale that describes three levels of racism so we can understand how does racism impact health and education and housing and all of those things. That's all been about raising, naming racism, but now the second important thing is how is racism operating here, this moving to action bridge. And that's a legitimate question, as I said, because racism is not a miasma, it's not a, you know, a kind of cloud that we can't get a handle on. It's a system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms which are in our structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. And I may have just given you a headache. What am I supposed to do with that, Dr. Jones? Structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. I'm in public health. Yeah, I do some policy stuff, but oh, that is too much. Until we recognize that each of these are the elements of decision-making where structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, especially who's at the table and who's not, and what's on the agenda and what's not. And whenever you find yourself henceforth at a decision-making table or when you set one, I challenge you now to have your first job to be to look around and say, well, who is not here who has an interest in this proceeding? And then your job is not just to represent their interests. Your job really is to, you know, in the short term, you might need to represent their interests, but your job is to create space, to find them a way to the table. And if structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, policies are the written how of decision-making, practices are the unwritten how of decision-making here and now, but we don't have to write that down. Just watch me. You'll see how we do things. Norms are the unwritten how of decision-making, but deeply embedded how we've always done things and how we expect you to do things going forward and values are the why. And if you take this question, how is racism operating here? And within 10 minutes, in a, in a meeting somewhere, you could say, you could look at who's at the table, what's on the agenda. You could look at the who, what, when, where, how, and why, and do within 10 or 15 minutes, identify five, 10, 15 prom promising early targets for intervention, levers for action. So I encourage you to take this question. I, can't do it justice right now, but take this question with you everywhere, including to your next group meeting. So um, I just wanted to quickly give you a three-part definition of health equity. Um, what is it? It's a process. Which process? Assurance. Assurance of what? Of the conditions for optimal health for all people. It's not an outcome. Actually, in the US, we talk about equity instead of equality. Here, you guys are still talking about equality, diversity, and inclusion with some equity talk. But the distinction is in the next part. How do we get there? 
Well, achieving health equity requires three things, valuing all individuals and populations equally. Yes, that's the equality part in the valuing, but then recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, and most importantly, providing resources, not equally, but according to need. How are health disparities related to health equity? Well, health disparities are the differences in outcomes. Health equity is all the opportunity stuff that came before. So health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. And if you're trying to figure out in your position, in your unit, are you about achieving health equity? Ask yourself, am I, are we valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices? And it's important to know even the history of your organization, much less if you're trying to solve a problem, if you're trying to untie a knot, wouldn't it behoove you to know how that knot was tied in the first place, and then recti and are we then working to rectify historical injustices? And finally, are we providing resources according to need? There are seven barriers to achieving health equity that I'd like to quickly name, and I would love some more questions about these during our Q&A in about um, five minutes. Um, the first is our narrow focus on the individual, uh, which makes systems and structures either invisible or seemingly irrelevant. The second is our ahistorical stance. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. The third is our endorsement of the myth of meritocracy, the story that goes something like this. If you work hard, you will make it. That's how we talk about it in the US. Well, I acknowledge that most people who have made it have worked hard, but there are many, many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field, which has been structured as is being perpetuated by racism, sexism, heterosexism, all of these systems of structured inequity. And when we deny racism, we blame those who haven't made it for being lazy or stupid. And there are many ways to deny racism. We could do like the CRED report authors did and say racism doesn't exist. Or we could be working on equality, diversity, inclusion, disparities, disproportionalities, equity, uh, cultural competence, cultural humility, structural competence, race, ethnicity, all of these things. And if we work on all those things, important things to work on, but we never say the word racism in our context of widespread and deeply held racism denial, we are complicit with that racism denial. The myth of a zero sum game is the fourth of these seven barriers to achieving health equity. The notion that if you gain, I lose. Love to talk more about that later. Our limited future orientation in my country and perhaps in yours, where the parts of the future that we can touch today are the, that will hopefully survive us are the children and the planet. We have a disregard for the children and a usurious relationship with the planet. The myth of American exceptionalism or British exceptionalism or any of these exceptionalisms where we're so, we feel we're so. Uh, ordained by God, so unique, so special that we are entitled to everything we have and have no interest in learning from others. And the seventh of these values, targets for action, actually, uh, these barriers to achieving health equity is white supremacist ideology, which I, it's actually the foundational one, but I put it seven so people can listen to me without closing their ears. And I don't say it as a lightning rod term. I say it as a description of a false idea. The false idea is that there's a hierarchy of human valuation by race. There is no such hierarchy. But the associated extended idea is, yes, there's a hierarchy, and that would put white people at the top as the ideal or the norm. But this white supremacist ide ideology, this false idea, has given many people in my country, and perhaps here, a sense of entitlement. It's resulted in the devaluation and dehumanization of people of color. And in my country, especially fear at the browning of America that has resulted in our very explosive political divide today. So what can we do today with all that I've said? Because I said the three tasks of a national campaign against racism, which are actually the three tasks of anti-racism as a process that is sequential, yes, but then looping and may well span generations. Those three tasks were to name racism, necessary, but insufficient. Ask how is racism operating here? And then organize and strategize to act. So here are my final words for what we can do today. First of all, we, especially as public health people, need to actively look for evidence of two-sided signs. Never be reassured that it looks open to you. Because you know what, truth be told, every open sign 
sign has closed on the other side. There would be no need for a sign that says open unless it was close to somebody else. Walk out in the wilderness, do you see a sign that says open? So that is an insight. But so always look for evidence of two-sided signs by saying, is there something differential going on here by race, by ethnicity, by language, by social class, by gender, by rural, urban, by all of the ways that opportunity is differentially structured and value is differentially assigned, looking not only at outcomes, but also at opportunity structures. We also need to burst through our bubbles of experience. Each of us is in a bubble of experience. Some are vast, some are smaller, some are tinted, some are polarized, some have been hardened by fear. But most of us in whatever kind of bubble of experience we are in, do not recognize that, um, that just on the other side of town, there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances. We need to create at the individual and institutional levels bubble bursting opportunities. We need to be interested in the stories of others, believe the stories of others, and then join in the stories of others. We need to develop a sensitivity to see the absence of. This is a very important superpower. Not just what who's not at the table, what's not on the agenda, what policies are not in place that if put in place to bring more social justice. We need to reveal lack of action, inaction in the face of need, because that is a prime way that structural racism manifests these days. But all the power is not just among those who are inside the restaurant. Those of us on the outside also need to know our power, need to recognize that action is power, and especially that collective action is power, because collective action informs us, inspires us, propels us and protects us. So I look forward to our continued conversation. Thank you for your attention to my brief remarks right now. Kamara, thank you so much. That was such a powerful and insightful lecture and a wonderful way for us to kickstart this inaugural lecture series from the Faculty of Public Health. You touched on so many things. And what I'd like to do now is just spend a few minutes with you to hear about the person behind the lecture a bit, and then you sort of left us with a few nuggets to pick up as well, which I'd love to, to explore with you. So the first question, Carr, is that you've been doing this work for a while, and for many of our listeners today, they're probably coming new to this and are thinking, gosh, can I integrate this into my public health practice? And this is potentially really difficult. And I want to just get a sense from you on what drives you to do this work and what have you learned over the years of operating this space in terms of how you protect your own resilience, but how you are ensuring that you're continuing to push forward in the, in the, state, in the face of oftentimes uh, resistance to this kind of work. So maybe a little bit of reflection as a public health leader taking on this big challenge and what have you experienced and how are you, how are you evolving? Thank you for that. Actually, there are two things and I'll try to be very quick with my answers. So first is, how did I come to be doing this work? Because I'm very classically trained. In undergraduate, I was a molecular biology major, never took a sociology course or political science or anthropology, none of that, right? I was just strict science. Then I did medicine and then a PhD in epidemiology, very straight along the way. But to make a long story short, I started asking why, as a physician, do we routinely in the US report the race of a patient in our chief complaint, the telegraphic message we communicate to one another. Why do we describe this 18 year old black female who presents with abdominal pain versus the 18 year old white female who presents with abdominal pain? Are we sharing successfully a racist image? Are we going to ha have different levels of attentiveness to the patient, different speeds? Are we gonna generate different differential diagnosis? So on the medicine side, I was challenging that. And then on the epi side, I was like, oh my God, I know why. I know why people do that. They think that race is a risk factor because we as epidemiologists do not, we just document these race associated differences without vigorously investigating the root causes of the differences. So then I started asking myself as an epidemiologist, what does the variable race measure? And it is a rough proxy in the US that is true for social class but very rough. People of color in our country are overrepresented in poverty. White people in our country are overrepresented in wealth, but the plurality of poor people and the majority here are white, right? And not all people of color are poor. So it's a rough proxy and it's only a proxy at all. It doesn't just so happen, but it's only a proxy at all because of structural racism. And so if you read the Gardner's tale or listen to that, you will understand that. So rough proxy for social class, rougher for culture, meaningless for genes, but precisely captures the social classification 
in a race conscious society. So when I understood that, then that meant that race was actually capturing the impacts of racism on health. I understand without apology that racism is the root cause of all of our race associated differences in health outcomes. Even if you say, oh, well, it's through social class, but why do we have the associ association with social class? It's because of racism. So uh, without apology, if you are measuring a, a, something that's a race associated difference, then we are talking about racism, okay? So, so it, it, and so people might want to come and slam me on that, but but I have become very clear of that. So now that I understand this, I need to let other people know, right? I, so then, I actually have developed measures of racism when I was at CDC. I um, have these allegories. I've kind of become known as a racism woman, even though I'm a I'm a methodologist. I'm a statistical methodologist. I've created a whole new system of statistical methods. I have my accelerated aging hypothesis, which is very similar to Arlene Geronimus's weathering hypothesis. We generated them at the same time. I presented mine like for five or six years, never published it except in my dissertation. So anyway, so Arlene, you know, has has what she calls weathering now, but that is true. That what she documented is true. And my two-part hypothesis was one that black-white differences in health outcomes across the board not just with blood pressure, which I recognized, which is what I documented over 40 years in the US, but across the board are due to the accelerated aging of the black population. And the second part is that the accelerated aging of the black population compared to the white was due to racism. So that's when I turned to developing measures of racism and have become the racism woman. Now, what keeps me 30 years later doing this is the young people. I have mentees and then they have mentees. I am passing batons you know, to the younger people. In this work, which we recognize is going to well span generations, we need to reach ahead to those ahead of us and say, what did you learn? What did you try that didn't work? What did you try that did? And we need to deliberately reach to those behind us, the young people, mentoring them, but also learning from them, but passing batons. So in my barrel of batons, I'm like, shoot, shoot, shoot. And people are catching my batons. And I say, if you catch a baton from me, you need to fashion your own barrel of batons that keep passing. And this is how we're going to go even just beyond collective action to have collective action of a critical mass. We are trying to develop a critical mass. So anyway, so it's the young people. The young people, and here's the last thing. If I weren't doing this, what would I do? I'd just curl up and die. Understanding what I know, I have to be in the struggle. And for some people who say, well, we can't do this in three or five years. I don't even think I'll see the end of racism in my lifetime. That's very well true. But if you don't work on it now, it's just gonna delay it for another generation. So what we as public health professionals and just as people, as world citizens need to do is take our part now, recognizing we may not see the end, but we have to be part of the struggle. And when you are acting, it's life-giving. We should be like sharks moving through that water acting and recognizing that we may not see the end, but we are progressing something. Progressing. Thank you. That was exactly what we wanted to hear because it's important for us to see what drives us to do this work and how we sustain ourselves in doing it as well. The second question uh, really is around the interface with policymakers, leaders of organizations and systems. Oftentimes the conversation around structural racism, the need to act, come from black minority ethnic staff, it comes from people who are often not in a position of power. And I wondered, how do we equip our practitioners from whatever background to have these conversations with policymakers, to have these conversations with our leaders within organizations and systems, to put this on the table in a way that doesn't generate defensiveness, but in a way that allows us to have a more authentic conversation about what needs to be done. So the second question is around policymaker engagement, leadership engagement on this agenda without engendering defensiveness. Any strategies, any lessons yes. and wisdom that you've given? So, so my strategy, of course, my personal strategy is the use of allegory, which is beyond narrative. So that's a, allegory and narrative are two types of storytelling. Right, but narrative, if you lift up a patient's story or your own story, if it's too far from the experience of the listener, then they might discount it and say, oh, you, it didn't really happen that way or whatever. But when you use allegory images that we all have seen or could see, and then we put it out, not as my story, but as an offering for us to engage with and poke at and learn from, um, then I find that useful. So you all can use my allegories too. <laughs> so you can take my gardener's tale, as I said, and, and have that in meetings. You can have people watch my TED talk. So, so my allegories will become, 
I need to sit and write my grown-up book, and I intend to turn each of my allegories into a separate children's book. I have about six of them in the public domain, but about 40 on my computer. So I want to do that. And I even want to turn my gardener's tale into a song very soon. So anyway, so I'm so 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 those hopefully will be tools that are out there. But the other thing is that you have to understand, no matter what you look like, no matter how you are racialized that racism is sapping the strength of the whole society. Once you do that, then you aren't entering these conversations as an ally, you're entering as a compatriot, right? And then how do you equip yourself with that knowledge? Um, you need to read history, especially, we're ahistorical. So if you, if you start reading history, you'll really come to understand that in the past leading to the present. And then if you start bubble bursting, if you go across town and stay a while, if you talk to strangers, if you engage with people on the other side, of your bubble and recognize the common humanity and different causes, that will also give you the power, the true understanding that this is sapping the strength of the whole society. Now, do you have to go, some, some people living as white say, oh, I would feel uncomfortable going to the black community talking about racism. Then don't go to the black community talking about racism. Go to the white community talking about racism. Go to your board meetings or to your neighborhood or your family or, or whatever. Um, and. I think that if you understand the truth, the, the trap that we will be pushed into by policymakers is prove it, show me the data, especially here we are in public health, right? And there are plenty of data in this country. If, if you look at, sometimes you don't collect enough data by race, um, you know, you're so, so rightfully understanding social class. In the US, we don't collect enough data by social class, you know, rightfully interested in race. We need to collect by both and look at the intersections and, and, and all of that. But, um, if you collect the data by race, that's good. And then you can even start developing or using some of the measures of racism that are that are out there. You could do that. But if they trap you into documenting the impacts of racism and then document it more, I don't believe you, or document it in this group or that group, that is a trap. What we need to do is actually do a different kind of research, which is intervention research. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens when we make massive interventions in these communities of color. What happens when we do this thing? Now, the thing about intervention research, it's not going to have necessarily a three to five year impact on outcomes. What you need to do, again, I wish I had told the gardener's tale, but let me just say this. If you have some poor rocky soil and you have a strong pink seed that even in the poor rocky soil didn't die, it grew up. It's here. Now you decide you're going to intervene and enrich that poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. That pink flower that's already sprouted may go up another quarter inch, but it's not until that flower drops its seed in that now newly rich soil that you're going to see the real benefit of the intervention. We have to be willing to make generational interventions. We can measure things along the way. We can measure, did we really enrich the soil? Right, So we can measure the opportunity structures along the way, but we won't see the biggest impacts on outcomes for a year. So, I mean, for a generation. So it means that policymakers, funders, you know, trust and all who want a three to five year outcome so they can take credit for something, this is not the game. We need to tell them that they need to make generational transmissions. Then, then, then the generations can take credit for it, but we can't get trapped into documenting, we must intervene. We can't just name, we have to move to action. Wonderful. Thank you, Kamara. Colleagues, now we move on to hear from three panelists, um, members of the faculty who are going to reflect on what they heard this morning, what it means for the work that they're currently doing here in the United Kingdom, and what it might mean for the future of our public health practice. So I'd like to order, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our three colleagues who will be working with us uh, on the panel today. So the first is Dr. Habib Nakfi, and he's the Chief Executive of the NHS Race and Health Observatory. Uh, the observatory works to identify and tackle health inequalities in health and care by facilitating research, making health policy recommendations, and enabling long-term transformational change. We'll next hear from Catherine Mbema, who is a medically qualified public health uh, professional. She's the Director of Public Health in the London Borough of Lewisham. Uh, she trained at Imperial College in London, and she has been doing fantastic work in London on thinking about anti-racism and racism as a public health 
crisis within the London system and interventions through the directors of public health to intervene. And then the third panelist is Professor Jill Peden, who is a consultant in public health and international health with Public Health Wales. Um, and uh, she leads work with the WHO European Office for Investment in Health and Development on Health Equity Solutions and Promoting Economies of Wellbeing. Uh, she has an honorary professorship with the University of Wolverhampton related to her work on violence prevention, improving the health of women and children, and uh, in prisons, uh, as well as evaluating complex uh, system change. So we've asked each of our panelists to do a reflection for three to five minutes. Following this, we'll have more time for Q&A before we close the lecture at noon today. So Habib, over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you so much, Kamara. It's always wonderful to, uh, to hear you speak with the richness of, the, of, of that narrative. Um, and as Kevin highlighted, the NHS Race and Health Observatory um, was established, in fact, just before the pandemic, um, to hold up a mirror around looking at some of the causes of the causes of the inequalities that we see in health with regards to race and ethnicity. Um, and you know, 26 months into that work, one of the biggest lessons I've learned um, is the, the point that you make so clearly, Kamara, around racism denial. And navigating that um, you know, at an individual level at organization and, and at a um, at a kind of structural uh, government level as well um, has been a huge kind of learning curve for me and for many of us in fact you know through the covid pandemic and so the question is exactly that you know do people want to give up or share their power and their privilege around some of the very fundamental principles of of um, of how we operate, how we, how this, you know, how countries have always uh, operated uh, um, in that um, uh, in that norm. And what we see is even where I guess racism is named and acknowledged, very often people or organisations don't know what to do. Uh, so it's it's how can we help? So we were. In fact, the observatory was established to, yes, put forward the evidence base, turn that evidence base into recommendations for change, and then thirdly, to help and support with implementation around that anti-racism model that you've highlighted, Kamara. So that's our, that's our, our aim, our, our goal. And, and the very first piece of work that we did um, was to look at racial bias in pulse oximetry. Uh, which was a very important thing for us to do in the middle of a pandemic that was affecting the oxygen levels of, of, of uh, people um, at that time. And so you know, the, the, the question arises then, I guess, is leadership and demonstrable leadership on this issue, which is absolutely essential. How can people lead all of the, you know, all of the people and communities all of the time and not some of the time? Um, and it does make me think, it does make me think about um, an example that I came across in my work over the last few years working in the, in, in the English healthcare system in the National Health Service around uh, an ally, a, a white male chief executive working in London of a hospital trust um, who uh, began to think about his own approach to anti-racism. So, and, and what he can do at a very individual level on a day-to-day -day basis. So this individual would tweet on a daily basis around the impact of racism on people. That person would attend the induction processes for new staff entering his organization. And very often that may well be 50 people at any given point in time. And he would be very clear in the induction process for those individuals that actually there is a zero tolerance around racism in my organization, he would say. And if that's an issue for you as new people entering my organization, then there's a door, this organization isn't for you. And he would look at the policies and the processes within his own organization, whether that's to do with recruitment or disciplinary processes or promotional processes, et cetera, and make sure that those are inclusive. But your point also, Kamara, is absolutely right. 
you know, people very often want and expect change overnight. And I always say, uh, you know, think um, about Mo Farah, not Usain Bolt. This is a marathon very often and not a sprint. Um, and but we need to be on that journey. Uh, we need to be in that in that in that running lane in the first place, and 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 so we need to kind of focus on uh, on uh, on that um, as we move forward. And I guess my kind of final observations um, are around um, you know how is racism and bias operating here, which is your point, and acknowledging that. And when the COVID pandemic broke out. I, like many others, knew that issues around equity would be on the back burner. And to be frank, I was very surprised on how quickly those issues went on to the back burner. Um, and we saw so vividly in this country around decision making around the, uh, the emergency response structures that were set up uh, at very local level, how they, those structures were not representative of the communities. And very often that was because leadership of organizations isn't representative in the first place. Uh, we saw very quickly how the new hospitals that were established in this country, the Nightingale hospitals, were not representative at senior levels. And the pictures we saw within the media uh, were not representative. We, we saw the, the message wasn't diverse. We saw, that the, we saw that the messenger wasn't diverse. And therefore, it was fantastic to see Kevin uh, at the number 10 uh, briefings uh, that we used to see on a daily basis and other colleagues uh, from, um, you know, from diverse backgrounds uh, within, those, uh, within those. And then of course, uh, access to PPE, vaccination hubs. And I remember putting out a tweet um, you know, on, on a Saturday morning to say, yes, you know, it's great that we've got indoor bowling clubs and uh, horse racing venues as vaccination hubs, but we also have black churches we have mosques, we have synagogues, we have temples, which are ideally placed uh, architecturally to be vaccination hubs, high ceilings, spacious areas, and the building of trust uh, amongst our communities. And so it's about identifying where bias and racism exists and how we can uh, we, we could focus on that by looking at trust, which, you know, as Kevin says, is a new determinant of health, absolutely right. And also looking at interventions, uh, intervention research and action uh, around an anti-racism approach, something that we are looking at within the observatory. Thank you. Great, thank you, Habib. Uh, Catherine, I'd like to invite you for your comments and reflection. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you so much, Kevin. And um, just want to say a huge thank you to Professor Jones for a wonderful, enlightening, amazing um, lecture. And I really want to also commend the faculty for convening this conversation. Um, you know, I've not long been in public health, too long. But, um, you know, we don't often have conversations, you know, so explicitly and frankly about racism. Um, I haven't seen that much in my career today, so I think it's been amazing. So thank you to the faculty for convening this. Um, I had three points. I'm, I'm floating a, a sea of uh, post-it notes here for my um, reflections. But um, the first is around um, the, the point you mentioned about exploration of how racism, racism is operating here. So, um, following on from what Habib said. I think um, we can name racism. We often then look at some evidence based about what we're going to do about action. But I think that deep exploration of how racism is operating, not only in the UK, but in London, because there's some spe there's specific structures, policies, all the things you've listed, there's things pertinent and specific to our um, individual settings. And I don't know if we do that deep exploration. I think uh, in London, um, the work that Kevin mentioned that we're trying to do as the public health um, in London, we named racism as the uh, position statement, one naming racism as a public health issue. We then um, looked at evidence based, opened to the director of public health and the action plan um, around. Catherine, can you just stay really close to your computer? Because sometimes your sound goes in and out. But I think oh, so sorry. Yes, yeah, stay even closer. Is that better? Yes. Oh, I'll, come, I'll come close. Um, yeah. So um, we uh, had the position statement. We moved to an action plan. But I think that deep exploration of how is racism operating here was maybe missed. So I think that's something definitely that to um, work. The next point was around. Uh, uh, 
assert the assertion that we can act to, dis to dismantle racism. And I think we need to continue to build that into our narratives when we are speaking to policy makers, decision makers, because often in conversation, it, it can feel overwhelming that this has been something with us for decades, so long, how are we going to take action, etc. This is the kind of conversation that comes up. And so I think making the assertion that there are things, very tangible things that we can do to act and continue to um, uh, uh, talk about that and build on that uh, is very important. I've got more time, I'm going to share two more things. Um, one is about the, uh, the uh, allegory that you used around the door and the open door, closed door. And I think, um, again, in conversations, even ones that I'm in, although I've experienced racism, I am in that, op I'm in the restaurant in that open door, you know, looking at the open door. And so really thinking about how we talk to people in the restaurant who only see that open door and to understand that there is, it is double-sided, I think was really striking for me. And again, build into narrative. And the final thing was ab about um, the bubble bursting. And um, in, sort of low this Lewisham specific work and um, we are trying to do that very thing so and um, get clinicians and we call them health equity fellows to be matched up with local community groups and um, some black-led organizations to form teams now it's challenging there is a power dynamic there and all sorts of things that come into that but um we had a welcome event for those teams uh, about a fortnight ago and um to me it was so lovely to see in the room people from grassroots organizations who don't often have a seat at the table, they don't have power, talking directly to clinicians who they would go and see, you know, people or whomever, in one room, talking about this, us wanting to do the same thing, the chief health equity. And I think eye-opening for both both sides of, you know, for the community groups to see that clinicians are ordinary people. You might not get your GP appointment on time, but it's because there's pressures that, you know, so just seeing them as human beings, likewise the clinicians to see the very real struggles of local communities, um, how groups, you know, go from hand to mouth on grant funding. So that bubble bursting, I think, is so important and um, I think really, really effective. Yeah, so those are my questions. Oh, well. Wonderful. Catherine, thank you so much. Some really wonderful themes coming up tomorrow from leadership, the pandemic experience, really thinking about action. And I love this bubble bursting and the things that we can all do in place. Joe, uh, your thoughts? And they will come back to questions with all entire panel. Thank you, Kevin. And um, thank you, Kamara, for a really inspiring um, lecture. I really enjoyed it. And I think um, I was thinking my emotions um, reflecting on how I felt as I listened to you. And I think I felt quite sad, actually. I felt sad because um, about 25 years ago, I did American politics and sociology at Un Manchester University. And it's the same issues. And, you know, I feel like, you know, are we making any progress on this journey? And I, 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 I felt sad that maybe, you know, we're, it's, it's a very slow journey and it really shouldn't be that way. And, um, and I also felt a bit ashamed, actually. I felt, I, I just sort of thought, oh, you know, how can, how can we make or how can we get more people to move into that social bus justice box? It's so important to get that awareness and that recognition that you know there is a problem. And you know, I'd really like to help on that, on on getting people into that box. And I think uh, a lot of us in public health feel that way as well. Um, so, and also, I, I was I was really intrigued when you talked about you know people who are disadvantaged, and we say you know. And, and then normality, but actually it's advantage and disadvantage. So that will stick with me, that, that, that um, expression. And I think it, it's quite a useful way to describe, you know, that, that dichotomy of opportunity that we have. Um, I think this, I think the title is Rhetoric to Action. So for me, I'm a real doer and practical, let's get on and, and sort this out sort of thing. Um, so for me, what are the levers in the system? What can we do? And working in uh, Wales, I think, um, is actually, we have we have some real opportunities that already exist. We have the Anti-Racist Action Plan, which is all about uh, breaking down that systemic racism and institutionalised racism. Um, we also have the Future Generations Act, which has seven health and wellbeing goals, which um, every public body has to work towards. And one of those is a more equal Wales. 
Uh, we also have the socioeconomic duty, which is a legal duty to look at um, uh, in all strategic decisions in public bodies to consider the impact of these decisions on those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So we have all these levers, um, you know, and I think other countries should follow suit and have these. Um, but it's about how you get those into organisations and you know, actually embedded and working against that institutionalized racism. And I think you talked about declarations, and I think that would be a really good start, start, starting point and something I'll take back to Wales, you know, can every organization in Wales have a race, racism declaration? And what does that mean? And how does that mean about how an organizational works? You know, these are practical things that we can chip away, you know, the, the racism that exists. And, um, and then finally, uh, we've recently launched a, a website, uh, Health Solutions Equity website, which I put in the, in the chat bar. And we're again, uh, using that to stimulate the, the solutions around health equity. Um, we've got data policies and evidence on the website, but again, we're having webinars to, to promote that discussion, that ongoing discussion about how we can achieve health equity. Um, I think for me, having worked a lot in prisons, um, the fact that 41% of uh, uh, children in the youth justice um, uh, service or in prisons have a BAME background is that that's just such a frightening statistic. And it shows to me that, you know, it is we do have institutionalized racism in this country. And the LAMI review in 2017, you know, made recommendations. Have those recommendations been taken forward? You know, have, have those things you recommended been done? That's a question. And maybe as the Faculty of Public Health, we need to be pushing on these things, um, you know, and, and questioning what's happened as a result of these reviews. Um, so yeah. I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, journey and hope it speeds up very quickly. <laughs> Joe, thank you so much. Um, thanks to our panelists for that wonderful reflection. And I think, Joe, that sense of, you know, have we been here before? Are we making a difference? Um, is exactly why we want to have these conversations. And we want to use this moment in time as we emerge from the pandemic, as I think there's a greater consciousness about these issues and a greater willingness within the public health family to have these tough conversations to ensure that we now, as public health practitioners, are part of the solution as well, right? So we're not innocent or non-innocent bystanders or passive bystanders, but we're empowering ourselves as part of our future public health practice to integrate this into what we do. So colleagues, last 10 minutes of the lecture, we have a time now for rapid fire questions and responses. And I'm going to ask you to keep your uh, responses short. We have a few questions that came in. If you're able to look at the chat, lots of positive uh, feedback. Kamara, to the panelists, to you all for your comments. So Kamara, the first one's for you. Um, colleagues want to know if the racism declarations in the States are being evaluated uh, and whether this is being an, as an active process of implementation or is it an organic process of implementation? So I haven't been actively evaluating them, but there are several different groups that are now trying to, first of all, analyze what, what is the range of things that have been declared and the action plans. And there is evaluation going on, including through the American Public Health Association itself, as well as others. So I would, again, refer folks to that website to just uh, see what's going on. And you can also put questions through to the APHA team. Wonderful, thank you. And this question, second one is, also for you, Kamara, and also for uh, Habib. Um, there's an issue about debating and having these issues with people who are racism deniers. Is there space, you think, for us to have conversations around these structural issues with people who are flatly trying to deny it, it, it exists? Or do you think we should expand our efforts and energies elsewhere? Uh, Kamara first, and then Habib. I don't think I, when people ask me how much should we focus on changing opportunity structures versus addressing value systems and put racism denial as a kind of value uh, abhorrent thing. I actually think most of our energy and investment should be in changing opportunity. Now, if you have to go through that person to, to make an investment in neighborhoods or in the justice system or whatever, then maybe you have to spend some time. But I'm willing to let a lot of people age out. All I want to do is I want to interrupt the intergenerational transmission of racism denial, which is what I intend to do with my children's books and the like. 
great. Happy, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Kamara. And I, I absolutely agree with Kamara. And, and of course, um, the evidence base uh, is so strong. So the data and the evidence should be the basis upon which any uh, narrative is put forward. Um, whether that's a financial case, the human resource case uh, that, that you highlighted earlier, Kamara, um, the, the human cost case. And of course, within healthcare, the patient outcome case is so strong. And I, I think we put that forward. And, and as Kamara says, we need to kind of prioritize our, our energies uh, on this agenda and make sure that um, we focus on the right things for the right reasons, that social justice aspect, absolutely critical. Great. Thank you. The next question is for Catherine and Joe, and this is around implementation. Uh, oftentimes we try to solve complex issues with a single solution. You know, I'm often asked, well, Kevin, what is the one thing that I can do to tackle structural racism in my organization? And I wonder to what extent you think there's one thing or is this a complex issue which requires multiple level interventions? acting at the same time to have a sort of design, over time to have an impact. I, I, it, it's not a leading question, it's, a, it's, it, it's in the chat. What do you think is necessary and what experience do you have in your systems around combining ways of, of tackling this issue? Catherine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm involved in work at multiple levels um, around health equity addressing racism. So I think at I, I think personally you need um, interventions at every level mm -hmm. and it's not just one thing at each of those levels. So for example, at borough level in Lewisham, as I've mentioned, where we've launched um, what we've called a health equity um, and health inequalities program, two year program, relatively short, but one of those work streams was around developing those health equity schemes. But we have a range of other things. We're looking at what we can do about improving social data. that we're looking at um, piloting um, different ways of doing outreach around prevention. So multiple interventions within one program over the course of two years. At South East London level with our ICS, um, we are working on a range of ways, it's not, it's not specifically around anti-racism, but trying to embed anti-racism within the work around health inequalities. And of course at London, as I mentioned, the work that Director of Public Health are doing, um, our specific work stream is called Public Health Tackling Racism and Discrimination. There are five work streams there um, around um, trust and cohesion, what we can do around data collection at London level, what we can do around diversifying the workforce. So we have um, launched a training programme that is on offer for all directors of public health and consultants in the London system around all the things we're discussing today, um, racism, cultural competence, narratives, uh, public health around racism. So, um, and that's a sort of workforce development of senior leaders within the London system, but again, is one work stream. So, and yeah, and we've got two other work streams there. So I think multiple layer um, um, of intervention needed and complex interventions at each of the levels. Fantastic. Um, and Jill? Thank yeah, you. It's, it's quite interesting. I've just been finishing some research that we've been doing on system leadership skills. And uh, we've interviewed 10 um, leaders in public health around the world. And there was a dichotomy between whether you take a Trojan horse, you gather momentum on one thing, and you get people to come with you, and then you broaden it out, or you take a sort of complex approach where you take lots of levers and there was real sort of like no agreement on which is the best way so personally I think that um you know and it depends what level you're working if you're working at a sort of national government level regional level or local level but I think the the starting point is to get the sort of key people in the room to have these sort of discussions that's the starting point you know you know show your wonderful you know lecture that you've just given to them and, and start the discussion you know where can we start what can we do and I think that's about sort of system leadership getting people on the on the right sort of starting point and understanding where they're coming from to then move forward so I, I think I, I don't think there's an answer to that question <laughs> well, so, yeah, and, and you're absolutely right it's about starting those conversations organizing to act building the sort of willing coalitions as well um, Kamara, if I could come back to you just on that, your reflection on that question about um, dealing with complex problems with simple solutions. And I wondered if, you know, you had any reflections on that, how you organize to act in ways that really help to drive, drive change. 
So I actually have proposed, and it's in a uh, paper that I published in the journal Ethnicity and Disease in 2018, is called, called Toward a National Campaign Against Racism. Mm -hmm. um, or no, it's called Toward the Science and Practice of Anti-Racism, Launching a National Campaign Against Racism. I propose an anti-racism collaborative with eight collective action teams. So what it is, is it's the collective action teams might be the single focus thing, but they remain in relationship with all of the others. And the idea, so the eight collective action teams are communication and dissemination, answering the question, you know, how can we talk about, how can we get people talking about racism at community levels and whatever. Um, uh, education and development, I'll just name them, global matters, history, liaison and partnership, organizational excellence, policy and uh, policy and legislation and then science and publications. So anyway, so the, these eight. Now, the idea is that in any given locale, you might have two or three of them. You may not have all eight in London, right? But even though the education and development one in London will, will reach out to the one in Glasgow or the, you know, in someplace in Wales, or, you know, so that the, along that thing, they will be aligned. It's a 3D network. And then they will also be aligned with all the others that are in London, even if it's just three of them. And so now you start to develop a 3D framework where you have alignment by the eight teams and there could be more than eight. We just started with eight. It actually started out of our uh, standing committees from the racism and health work group at CDC. We had seven and then we added history because we had forgotten history. How could we have forgotten history? So now there are eight that APHA um, proposed. And then those, the leaders of each of those would meet monthly co coordinating at the global le level and then along the thing also monthly so it becomes coordinated. So it's both, it's all. People working with the tools they have from the locations where they are, doing the work that they can do, but collective action, not just in the little organization, but collective in a very big way. Fantastic. Kamara, thank you so much, Joe, Habib, and Catherine. Uh, we're coming now to the end of the session today. What a wonderful way to kickstart this uh, uh, inaugural lectureship series, this distinguished lectureship series with Professor Kamara Jones. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, your responses today and ensuring that we had a chance to both reflect on uh, Kamara's lecture, but also to think about the work that we're doing in our nations, in our localities and in our organizations. I hope colleagues that as you've listened to the lecture today, you too have been inspired. And I can see from the chat as well as the questions that many of you are looking at both sharing your experiences, but also reflecting on what this means for your current and future practice. And Kamara, thank you so much for such a wonderful and powerful lecture as well. Part of thinking about the future of public health is opening ourselves and opening our eyes to be challenged in new ways, to learn from others who are doing fantastic work in our space, but also working in other spaces as well. And looking at how we can take some of the best and promising practices to take the ways in which we're challenged, to reflect on and to think about what we do differently. And I'm hoping that as colleagues have heard your presentation today, Kamara, they've been both inspired, but also challenged to act as well. And that has been a core feature of your, 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 your lecture today. So colleagues, thank you so much for joining us. The event has been recorded and it will be placed online and will be available uh, shortly. Huge thanks to so many colleagues who've worked behind the scenes to make this inaugural lecture possible today. And I'd like to thank specifically the staff at the Faculty of Public Health, as well as the board members of the faculty who conceptualized this distinguished lecture and who've been a key part of driving it forward. A special thanks to Professor Kamara Jones and to all of our other panelists and speakers for their expert insights. And we'll be announcing the next lecturer in our Distinguished Lectureship series shortly. So please stay tuned, share with your colleagues, uh, other members of the faculty, the lectures are open, and we really are keen to stimulate new thought uh, on public health practice. So if you have ideas for the Distinguished Lectureship series, please let us know. We're open to hearing from you as well and co-creating this amazing opportunity to learn together. Thanks everyone, take good care and all the best.